I, yeah, I just know you do that all the time. I try to bury you in the comments section. You do. You I can't, I can't wait time. till I drive home and I do this rapid fire segment. <laughs> you are done. Yeah, I look forward to that. Hit that subscribe bell and join Hashtag Nation. All right. Pierre Martinez. Talk about Patrick Mahomes and how he compares to Allen from a talent standpoint and in terms of progression from year one to year two. Can Allen make the same jump that he did? I realize we should have more realistic expectations and limit our sights to Darnold and Rosen, but Allen needs to become MVP caliber if the Bills are to accomplish more than making the playoffs, which would be nice. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think... Um, a lot of people have high expectations due to all the offseason moves that have been going on, plus the fact that Allen will have another year under his belt. Expecting him to have a Mahomes-like impact on the league, I think would be kind of tough for two different reasons. The first reason being that Dayball and the system that they run is not comparable to Andy Reid's system, which is mainly a West Coast system. That being said, I don't think he'll have that type of meteoric jump because when you're talking about Andy Reid, who's been in the system, who's been in the league forever, turning multiple quarterbacks into Pro Bowl quarterbacks, um, that that's one thing. I don't know from a from a statistical standpoint, they will have similar stats. They both can run. They both have amazing arms. Uh, from a talent perspective, they are pretty comparable. So if you're one of those people that do compare Allen and Mahomes. Um, giving up the 10th pick to Kansas City uh, doesn't seem as daunting of, a, of an issue at this point, seeing that you end up, were able to flip all of those to get Trey White and uh, Jermaine Edmonds as well. Conrad Gazuski. What players should I keep on my radar as possible trade options for the Bills? Also, you two seem as you could be professional football analysts, but what are your actual day jobs? I re Every time that Paul and I get a compliment like that, we're extremely humbled. Uh, I'm glad you guys feel so highly about some of the stuff that we talk about, and I do appreciate that. I mean, I've been around the game for about 30 years now, um, you know, watching the game, playing football, coaching it, and all that stuff. So it's great to uh, see some of the things all that time that I had wasn't wasted on anything. Um, but our actual day jobs, I think Paul Berg actually answered it. Uh, I don't know what Paul does. I think he, uh, he's a... I don't know what he does. I think he's a street sign. I'll have to check on that, though. I don't know which corner. That being said, I, I'll, as soon as I get more information, I'll tell it so you guys can go see him. But I am a uh, I am a math teacher in the city of Buffalo. All right, and so practice squad. How many guys are on it, and how do they determine who's on? Do they have a role, or is the practice squad just the minor leagues? Yeah, they have, they have a very significant role in the practice squad. I believe that the maximum you can hold. Now, Paul, we did an episode prior to that talking about the practice squad, or it was embedded in a couple other episodes. I'll try to put it right here if that's the case. Um, there's 10 guys that you can be on the practice squad. And I think Christian Wade does not count against either the cap or the practice squad eligibility with some of the guys. Uh, how do you qualify for that? You have to have less than three years NFL service. Now, NFL service can be, as Paul, I'll let Paul explain it to you. Technically play. Okay, so the way that it works out is you have to have under three years worth of eligibility. Right? Okay. So right. that's it. And but three years of eligibility means a bunch of different things. So you have to be on a if you're on the practice squad for six weeks, you can you are considered having a year of football eligibility okay. used. Okay. Right. So you know that's how that works. You could have you have to be on an NFL roster for three weeks or um, in the practice squad for six weeks. That's how you get a year of eligibility. Okay. You didn't think I kept him around for his looks, did you? Okay, I really want, uh, this is from Elliot Eisler. Uh, I really want to see y'all tackle Dayball going into year two. Do we give him three years, like a head coach, to implement everything he wants to and have the players he quote-unquote needs? Y'all have been tough on him in the past. 
but would like to hear y'all go over some realistic scenarios for his future if we do well or vice versa. Thanks, fellas. Go Bills. Yeah, we have been highly critical of Brian Dable with a lot of the things that he's trying to implement. The big, the big thing is that uh, from a quality control standpoint, every time we mention quality control, basically what we're talking about is how they go into games, how they prepare for their opponents. Uh, they happen to do very well in that. If you look at some of the scripts, now when we mentioned scripts, you guys all know this. This is about the first 10, 15, maybe 20 plays of the game. Okay, this is what we're going to run to try to test to see how we perform against this defense. If you're able to score points while running the script, you have done a good job. If you're able to move the ball, you're able to do a good job. Um, and you're starting to perform really well. The script going into the game and coming out of halftime, He's been very, very well. He's done very, very well. He has lulls in the game, though, just like anybody. Um, so I would like to see him. He's good at, and I mentioned it on a, on a previous episode, Not only the mark of a good coach is not not just exploiting their weaknesses, it's exploiting their weaknesses while covering up your own at the same time. What are the weaknesses that he has? Okay, what the Bills have decided to do and what Bean has, has done as he grabs insurance policies, just like we're talking about with his players, he dra- he signed a bunch of offensive linemen and then drafted an offensive lineman. Um, you know, and in that respect, he likes to have insurance. So, what did the what did Bean do this off season to off offset Dable doing well or doing poorly? He signs Ken Dorsey. Now, what that means is that if the Bills happen to do really, really well and Brian Dable gets head coaching offers and happens to go to be a head coach, you have Dorsey in the fold sitting there. Basically, you know, as a quarterback coach, that could easily make a transition to offensive coordinator if he had to. That's their thought process. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. I'm saying that's their thought process. The other thing is if he does poorly and you're seeing all the mistakes that are being made, Dorsey's already there. You're not bringing outside someone outside to do this. So you have familiarity with Dorsey. You have that insurance policy to take care of anything if Dable does well or bad in that respect. The thing I'm going to I'm gonna wonder with Dable going into year two is how is he going to use all the new toys that he was given? Now, I will, I will say this. He's not going to have... Um, He's not going to have instant chemistry with some of these players. So if the offense does start slow, I think they give him about a five or six game window. And if they're still not scoring points and this defense is, is performing to the level that I think it's supposed to perform to, um, it'd be hard hard to see where he is in that respect, given all these, you know, given all this talent around him. How is he going to perform in that role? I'm so interested to see it because right now it's – very, very much in the air of what's going to happen with this offense. Rick Beam, how did you guys meet? Was Paul getting bullied in school and Mario stepped in and said, <laughs> look here, little girl, pick on someone your own size. <laughs> no, actually, uh, I, will, I will put it up here again, a little bit of a card. Uh, the hashtag history, which all seven of you watched a long time ago when we did it last year. Uh, the hashtag history stories uh, is pretty pretty entertaining. Um, yeah, Paul and I were invited uh, to do a show. A uh, mutual friend of ours, Thomas Loop, or Tom Proctor, had the show called The Thomas Loop, where he would he would bring various athletes and, and uh, musical artists on to talk both about music and sports. So the one uh, episode that we went on, uh, it was it was August of 2012. Paul and I went on the show. He was the musical guest. I was the athlete. And we were talking. And the first subject that both of us talked about in depth was the whole scandal with Jerry Sandusky. And that was the first episode. And then we, we exchanged numbers and started talking more about sports, which morphed into a podcast, which then morphed into what you guys get to watch every week. Justin Lawrence. Who's going to be our number one wide receiver this year? I think Zay going to get it done this year. See, that's the weird part about it. If, if, I, if, the, if the Bills come into the season with the system that I think they're going to come in with, uh, I, there's no clear-cut number one wide receiver. Um, the, Dable came over, I know, true, Dable came over from New England. They run the EP system, the Earnhardt Perkins system. In that system, 
you're, you're taking advantage of matchups. So it doesn't matter. Uh, one wide receiver could have, you know, six catches one week, and they can have one the next week. You could have a wide, you can have a running back that runs the ball 17 times one week, runs it three the next week. It's very, you're taking what the defense gives you in that system. So in that respect, I don't know if there's going to be a clear cut, quote unquote, number one like an AJ Green or, or Antonio Brown or Julio Jones or. Any of those guys that are what you call clear-cut number one wide receivers, I think it's going to be by committee, and I think you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of that this year. AJ Senior, with everything in place, what do you expect numbers and wins wise from Josh Allen revisited? Okay, um, we did an episode examining the opponents. I've been doing that a lot so far. I think this is just a contact episode. I think 10 wins would not be out of the realm of possibility for the Buffalo Bills. Um, just just for who they're playing. Uh, they're playing nine teams that they play, or nine games that they play. They're playing a quarterback who's either in the first year or second year. That, that's being if, uh, if Drew Locke happens to start um, in Denver. You know, you got a lot of those guys there. So that being said, You know, I, I, I did a predict, prediction episode where I think combined passing and rushing, Allen will have roughly around 43, 40, 400 yards and account for 35 of the offensive touchdowns. So I don't know how many of those touchdowns will be rushing and passing. Um, I mean, if he had, I mean, if he had 28 passing touchdowns and seven rushing touchdowns, I don't know if that's a very high ceiling for the team. McDermott said he wants to score 21 points a game, which means he feels confident in his defense keeping teams under 21 points a game, which is a very daunting task because if you think about it, I mean, that's holding the team to under a touchdown per quarter, which the Bills' defense is very capable of doing, but it's a very tall task to, to try to get that every single week. So we'll see. Uh, I think the, the, the floor would be eight wins. I think the ceiling would be 12 wins. Uh, I think they, they settle in somewhere around 10. But there's nothing really limiting this team from, from taking a big step forward other than uh, the development and the chemistry of this offense.